So if you go around looking at the different accounts in the Gospels, the appearance of the resurrected Christ, you get what would be apparently different differences, but just like somebody watching certain things uh, from different perspectives, uh, different times, you get differences, but that doesn't mean that there are errors. So we're looking at the Galilean appearances, which already resolved the ones in uh, uh, Palestine, uh, in Jerusalem. Let's take a look at those and see if there are any discrepancies there. In Galilee, the Galilean appearances are not recorded in Mark and Luke, but are described in Matthew 28, 16 to 17 and John 21. Now, Matthew 28, 16 records that the eleven went to Galilee, evidently waiting for Jesus to appear as he promised in the message delivered by the women. According to John 21, Peter and six others decided to go fishing, and Jesus instructed them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. When the disciples came ashore, they found Jesus cooking breakfast for them. Jesus had his well-known feed my sheep conversation with Peter and told them about his future martyrdom. John mentions that this was the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead, meaning that it was the third time he appeared to them as a group. John 21:14. The first meeting was with the eleven minus Thomas, and the second meeting was when Thomas was present. So the appearance of the appointed mountain and on the appointed mountain in Galilee, Matthew 28:16 to 17, took place sometime after the shoreline appearance. And these verses actually pick up the narrative of the chapter quite logically, since a few verses earlier, Jesus had told the women to tell his brethren they'd see him in Galilee. After the parenthetical comments about the story the Jewish leaders concocted to explain away the missing body, the account takes us to Galilee to where the appearance just promised. Many suspect that this meeting on the mountain in Galilee was the occasion in which Jesus appeared to over 500 people at one time. 1 Corinthians 15, 6. There's another passage. Doesn't mean they're contradictory. This is additional information. And by this time, by this time, word of Christ's promised appearance would have spread among his many followers and given them time to arrive. So Matthew 28, 16 to 17 does not specifically state that others were present with the disciples. Nothing in the verse precludes the possibility that more followers had gathered there. Seeing Jesus there, the disciples worshipped him. And although others still were doubtful, the eleven had by now seen Jesus more than once, and some had even eaten with him, and some doubted, likely refers to others who had not seen him before. Sensitivities here. Last appearances. We learn from 1 Corinthians 15:7 that Jesus met with his half-brother James after appearing on the mountain. While we cannot be sure of the place of this meeting, it makes sense that it would have happened in Galilee, since that is where Jesus and James grew up and where James shows up in the Gospel narratives. Wherever this occurred, it seems to have been the catalyst for James, who was a skeptic, even being the brother to believe that his half-brother truly was and is the Son of God. Amazing how close you can be. But then look at Judas, which we just discussed before. 1 Corinthians 15, 7 also explains that Christ was seen by all the apostles one more time after his visit with James. This event is recorded in Acts 1. So, Jesus led the apostles as far as Bethany on the eastern side of Mount Olivet near Jerusalem. There he gave them their final instructions before he ascended into heaven. The Apostle Paul stated, Then last of all he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. This appearance occurred while Paul, then called Saul, was traveling to Damascus on a mission to persecute Christians. And that's in Acts 9, 1 to 9, 1 to 9, and then 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Conclusion. We have a timeline here. Make it blow it up a little bit. Come on down again. Go up even more. See if it's any bigger. Well, it's a little bit more legible. <clears throat> you can see the uh, timeline of the post-resurrection appearances. 
Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, and Salome, and so on. So it's harder to read here, but there's a timeline. And so there are multiple appearances, but there are no apparent contradictions. So assuming the infallibility of Scripture, until otherwise specifically found to be not plausible, thus the ver verity of the uh, veracity of the eyewitness accounts, here is one possible post-resurrection pre-ascension uh, timeline that may account for all that's revealed to us in God's Word. And blow it up even more. Come on down again. So you can see that there. Now these are plausible, not refuted because there's no there's no evidence to that effect that would not make them plausible. Like a good reporter piecing together a story from reliable eyewitnesses, we must examine all the eyewitness accounts recorded in God's Word and realize by faith that for Scripture to be reliable, they must all be true. But then we'd look at the evidence and they appear to be very plausible. Then see how they fit together without any contrivances. contrivances. Together, these accounts tell us about the most important truth in the history of the world. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for our sins and rose again, conquering sin and death for our salvation and for the glory of God. And I would add that by a moment of faith in him, that alone, you have eternal life. John 3.16 and hundreds of other passages say that. And those who did not see him, like us, have also been called to believe. There it is. Believe? Anything else? No. Believe on him and are promised the incredible blessing of eternal life for that belief. So, Habakkuk. If God cannot look upon sin, how can Satan? And okay, that's another contradiction. Let's move, move back to the contradictions. We're at 36, then 37. Did Stephen err when he said that the number of descendants of Jacob were 75 souls? I'm working on this in Acts chapter 7 <clears throat> because there are a lot of people that say uh, the number of years that uh, were spent in Canaan and then in Egypt and uh, there's some discrepancy, and that has to be resolved. And then we take the number of years. How could 75 people start and then end up with millions of, of Jews at the end of the times? And also, uh, there are different count, accounts of uh, the descendants uh, being different numbers. Okay, so archaeological evidence, first of all, of Joseph in Egypt, who's key to this whole idea because... Joseph was also a descendant. Okay. Go back to that. And there we go. Okay, it's a lot smaller now. Well, there's a stone there above the River Nile's first cataract, the formidable rapids of Aswan, a granite boulder, look over here, this granite boulder with writing on it, with hieroglyphic writings, was discovered. A sculptor evidently who lived over a thousand years later than the events he described chiseled out the account of an individual called Imhep, Imhotep, Imhotep, who saved his country from seven years of famine. Other inscriptions were found in a monument to Horemheb, a pharaoh who came to rule several years after the Exodus, providing evidence of the story of the Pharaoh in Joseph's day, extending an invitation to Jacob's family to live in Egypt. The inscriptions tell of a community of shepherds from the north asking Egypt to allow them to pasture their cattle, as was the custom of the father of their fathers from the beginning. And a picture was found on a wall in the tomb of Tehuti Hetep in Bershe in a, of a herd of Syrian cattle entering Egypt with the inscription, Once you trod the Syrian sands, now here in Egypt you shall feed in green pastures. And another excavation at the Step Pyramid at Saqqara, fragments of a statue of Pharaoh Dosher were found. 
the base were in, was inscribed with the names of Dosher and of, here again, Imhotep, Chancellor of the King of Lower Egypt, Chief under the King, Administrator of the Great Palace, Hereditary Lord, High Priest of Heliopolis, Imhotep, the Builder, the Sculptor, and the Maker of Stone Vessels. Boy, that's a lot of vases. That's uh, a lot of uh, titles. This apparently fits Joseph pretty well, so there's a very strong plausibility that it was there. There's the, the uh, pyramid. And there, the, these are the places where the granary was, apparently. At another excavation, here we have here an inscription showing the name and t -t titulary of Imhotep, as we see it here, in the third row to the left. Oh, there it is, right there. And the Horus name of Dozier. This inscription was found on the base of a sculpture of Dozier, thus indicating Imhotep was a real man as opposed to a god. So a lot of corroboration here. Archaeological evidence shows that it was during the time of Dozier that Egypt became a great nation. During his reign, a large complex was built at Saqqara, Egypt, which contained the future, future burial site of the pharaoh. There's the uh, close-up. Surrounding the step pyramid, the first ever built, is a very beautiful and elaborate wall containing 13 false entrances and one real on the east wall at, at the southern end. There's, this is actually, this entrance led into a system of huge grain storage bins, evidence the famine when Joseph and the 75 came to Egypt because of the famine. When one enters, one encounters a long hall of 40 columns, 20 on each side, quite extensive. Each column is connected to the main wall by a perpendicular wall, forming small rooms between each column. There we go, all those columns are pretty close together. At the entrance to this complex, there were 40 small cubicles between columns, each just the right size to hold a single person who could administer this receipt of payment from people coming to purchase grain. It is evident that these cubicles did not contain statues, as some contend, because there were found no remains of statues or the pedestals upon which they would have been placed. So much to answer to that. We have some walls here. If you read this writing, And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, Gather all the flood of those good years, the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh. So these are granary bins. People came from all over. As you exit this colonnade and walk straight ahead, you come to a series of very large pits which extend deep into the earth. These are the pits. These are extremely large in size, much larger than any burial chamber. They are all certainly centrally accessible by a connecting tunnel. They extend to well above ground level, and one has a staircase extending down to the bottom, which we looked at earlier. See, see below, we'll look at that later. It is evident that they were not built as burial tombs because they were not con constructed underground and were so incredibly large. Here are the stairs again. Above is the staircase that leads to a central exit point for all the grain storage bins. And these massive structures extend to well above ground level, which indicates that they were not hidden as were tombs in order to prevent tomb robbers from taking the belongings that the pharaoh would be buried with. Note that there were found bins which matched the above ground bins, which were set aside for the king and his family's afterlife, and in these bins were found grain and other foodstuffs as well on the remains of it. There are 11 pits, with only one containing a very elaborate stairway all the way to the bottom. All the pits are connected to each other by a subterranean tunnel. The pits were evidently capable of being filled, and the top sealed with wooden timbers and stone. Hence, all of the grain could be accessed from one entrance, the one entrance into the pits from outside the wall enclosure of the complex. Last of all, grain was found in the floor of these pits. There's your evidence of what was in there. So, in the absence of any evidence of anyone being buried in these pits, the grain found at the bottom of them, their massive size and their being above the ground, the best conclusion is that they were used as storage bins for grain to feed the people. So, there was Joseph who came ahead, right? He was lost, thrown into the well, supposedly, but actually he was sold. So, Stephen is accounting this history of Israel. He continued his testimony to the same